Hey, you're watching The Intersection, where faith, life, and culture meet. I'm Eric Targe. I'm Justin May, and oh man, it's good to be back. Dude, we are in season two season of two, The baby. Intersection, season two. This is not only great because it's season two and because we're kicking back off again, but this is great because we are kicking off a new series. Yes! Tell us about the new series, Pastor. This, is, this has been something that's been exciting me for quite some time, because uh, we're talking about advocacy, advocacy for humanity at the margins. And so we, we labeled uh, this series Life and Breath, focusing on these, this idea that God gave man breath. And who are we to take breath from man? And who are we to, to not give uh, the ability for man to breathe? There's a, a tendency when it comes to so many on the margins where they, they feel as though they are suffocating uh, under stress, under anxiety, under either societal and systemic pressures or even pressures that exist within the church or within so many other things. And so what we're, what we're doing is we're talking, about, uh, we're talking about prisoners. We're talking about those with disabilities. We're gonna be talking to Johnny Erickson Tata. I'm really excited. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about adoption. And we're gonna be speaking with Dr. Russell Moore from the Ethics and Religious Liberty Convention of uh, Southern Baptists. Uh, there, there's so many amazing things we're talking about. But today, I'm, I'm really excited because we're starting the series uh, on a topic that probably is one of the most neglected mm -hmm. topics, I think, personally. I may be wrong. I would think that it's one of the most neglected uh, topics of advocacy at the margins uh, within the church, and yet it comes up over and over and over and over and over again in Scripture. And I'm talking too much. Justin, yeah. what's happening today? Hey, man, we are talking with a very special guest about widows and widow care. Joining us today, we're very excited to have Miriam Neff. She is the founder and president of Widow Connection. She is an author, she is a wife, she is a mother, she is a grandmother, and uh, man, we, and she's a counselor, and she does a lot of stuff, and we are so excited to have her with us. Welcome, Miriam. I am just honored to be with you, and you've really touched on so many important things Yes, I'm a widow, but also I have adopted children, adopted grandchildren. So I knew the James uh, 127 verse, which I'm sure you'll talk about, but I, ta I thought about orphans before because we adopted orphans. Now I'm a widow. When I became a widow, it's like I missed. I missed this very important category. Now I'm one. And so that is part of my story, but I'm honored and I'm so grateful that you're doing this topic. It is neglected and I'm not just biased. I'm telling you, I've been doing this for a little while now, 14 years. So many churches haven't awakened to the blessing of serving and working with their widows, as well as orphans and prisoners and aliens and the, the other categories that are often grouped together in scripture. Mm -hmm. Well, Miriam, maybe I think I think you've launched into a little bit, but can you help us just as we're launching into this idea of widows? Can you tell us your story? Why why is widow connection what it is? What what happened in your life? If you can go into a little more detail, though, you gave us a hint that that made you uh, awoken to this need. Well, I could talk for a long time on that, but I will condense it to say I married at 19 was blessed to marry a man that uh, very much wanted me to finish my education and you know, become a counselor that I was. And we both believed in life. And we had two children born to us, two adopted. And life goes along and you think, we'll sometime retire together. Rarely does that happen. In 10 marriages, in eight of those marriages, the man will leave this planet before the woman. So we are a large demographic. There are 1 million more of us every year. Well, when I became a widow, I thought the life as I knew it was over, traveling with my husband all over the world, which we did, my social life, my career, all of those things seemed to end at the same time. But you know, God doesn't let that happen. When you are a Christ follower, he has a plan for whatever that stage is. And I was in Africa in Ouagadougou. Now, this is just, you, it's almost unbelievable, but it's, it's my life. I was there trying to connect with a ministry he started in radio. And 
they said, well, you're a widow now, so we're going to gather some widows. You can teach them from the Bible. And I thought, okay, I'll do that. I love the Bible. I've been a Bible teacher and person in many venues. Well, there were 200 widows packed under a roof, young, the first time I taught there, very hot day. And I taught from the widow story in the Old Testament, the widow in her pot of oil. It's cross-cultural today. At the end of the time I had talked with the translator, they said, come back tomorrow. It was packed with 250 widows. That night in my hotel room in Ouagadougou, I didn't feel God tap me on the shoulder, but do you know what? God tapped me on the shoulder. Mm-hmm. What are you going to do about this? You're a widow. You've tried to be scammed out of your life insurance money. You've lost friends. Your world is upside down. You've come here, look at them. What are you going to do? So there's my story. So I went home and just started the simplest thing I knew to do. I had been a writer and a counselor. I started a website. And I talk about grief and depression and losing friends and all of that. And then Moody Press said, well, that should be in a book. And then I'm thinking, I've got to get back to those widows in the villages of Africa. And so you'll see from uh, connecting with me that I have a big global outreach now. This is the story. So that's a very um, condensed part of it. And if you'd like any more information about how the Splendid Hotel in Ouagadougou is not very Splendid, I can tell you that story too. That's for me. I, I love what you talked about there because you you were saying uh, about the needs of widows, and I think there's a lot of misconception about those needs. Justin, you and I were talking about that a little bit. Right. I mean, it, it's such a well, like you referenced James one twenty seven. We'll get to that one in a second. But the role of women in general, not just widows in particular, right, has changed a lot since the Bible was written. And so I think it's very common for like us in 21st century America to kind of write off, maybe not deliberately, but to sort of put some of the widow care and orphan care things on the side because we think, well, no, 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 we've got systems in place. We've got, you know, government safety nets, you know, like, I mean, what what in your experience is is different now versus say like you know the way we read about things in the bible and and what's what's the same what ought we to be doing well let me just be the nerdy person and give you one a couple of numbers in the united states when a man uh when his wife dies his need for money for them his need for money goes down 20 percent. his income goes down 20 percent. so that widower is still fine the widow on the other hand when her husband dies, her income goes down a third. Her need only goes down 20%. So the difference between 66% and 80% is poverty, sell something, make a change, get another some other kind of income. They might have been okay before, and now she's not. So this is in the United States. Now in other countries, sometimes it wor- it's worse. But for us to assume she's okay, and also that she understands her finances or has been doing the numbers and the budget. My husband and I did that together, that's fine. But many have not, I was was not overseeing our portfolio at the time. I've had a blast. I just love learning about it and doing that. But that was a new thing for me to learn. And by the way, that wasn't something my church ever said, do you need help with this or need a contact person or anything like that? So I'm trying to waken churches, 103 verses say, talk about us, 103. So if you're a Bible-based church, I mean all the Bible, then you're going to run across the direction. And God says, if you bless widows, he'll bless you. He'll bless your church. Job said, I made the widow's heart sing. So, I mean, this is just clearly the word of God. And I wrote the book, Not Alone, about 11 widows in scripture. We don't often think of Mary, the mother of Jesus, as a widow, or Bathsheba. Uh, Anna, of course, we recognize she's a widow. But many of them remarried Tamar. What a story. Oh, my word. Widowed twice. So I dig into these and learn about them and share the truths of them. This is all in the Bible. It's, it's It's our manual. So I'm trying to help open that so that people can see the biblical basis and respond. 
I, I, I love that because what you're saying is that the need, the needs are in some ways different, but the needs are still very much there. This, this hasn't disappeared. And yet I think we, we would agree, and we kind of said it a little bit at the beginning, Christians aren't typically known for this, right? They're not known for widow care in, in 2020. And yet you have like James 1, 127, right? You've referenced, yeah. Yeah, it says religion that our God, uh, that God our Father accepts as pure and faith faultless is to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And I, I, I'm just curious because you've been doing this ministry for quite some time. You, you've been in this for a long time. If, if the religion that God accepts as pure and faultless is to care for the widow, why do you think it is that that Christians are, are known more for uh, worship services, Bible studies, and uh, cheesy Christian movies. Uh, they're known for those things. They're more no known for, for politics than for actually caring for widows. You, you mentioned, you said how many references are there in scripture? 103 verses, but there are at least 11 widows who's, who have prominent stories in the Bible. You hear stories of David and Goliath. Have you ever heard the story of Bathsheba as a widow? Or, I mean, so what I, what I would say to answer your question about why is this, we have become trendy. Mm. And, and what's the trend? What's cool? And I remember a time when no one talked about women being trafficked. That, that was not a topic anyone talked about. Now, and I don't mean to say it's not important, but it has caught on and people pay attention. In fact, many of the widows that we serve in Africa uh, have gone into prostitution. Mm -hmm. And we know that also many of the girls in prostitution became prostitutes because their dad had died. Their mom couldn't afford to take care of all the kids. So they sent daughter to uncle or neighbor or whatever. So. Now I'm digressing from my topic, but in a way I decided, Lord, what do I do? And I clearly know if I do my job well, there will be fewer women in those traffic situations. Yeah. Well, you're not digressing at all. You're, you're, what you're doing is you're showing us, and I had, like, I had not thought about this, Miriam, the fact that there's a, a systemic issue here, that when you don't care for the widow, that has an effect on her kids, which should seem obvious, but. If you care about sex trafficking, then you should care about widows. And again, my husband and I decided a few months after we were married, we both believed in life. So what were we gonna do about it? We decided we'll both have children and adopt if we have health and work, which we had those, so that's what we did. Imagine many of the orphans in other countries, their moms are alive. They've been dropped off at an orphanage because the mom can't feed them. And in many cases here, orphans that go into different kinds of care are there because there's a woman who can't take care of them. Is she a widow? Was she never married? Whatever. Your point is well taken that many of these connect. But one thing that God has been so gracious to show me, Miriam, stick to what I've called you to do. Now, if you do what I've called you to do, yes, you're going to impact some of these other categories but you stick to what I've called you to do because when I became a widow, I couldn't find one Christian resource for widows, not one. And that was in 2007. Mm -hmm. I, I could read about Jacqueline Kennedy, who was a pretty bold widow. She was standing well, but I'm a spiritual person. So her story didn't touch me in my spirit. I could find none in 2006. So. Uh, you might know when you go to my website, I've been doing something about that. That's excellent. The, the thing that I think about a lot, right, when we talk about whatever, I mean, all of these issues, right, we talk, you know, we're, right now we're focusing on widows, but when we talk about widows, orphans, uh, sex trafficking, I think so much of a modern evangelical response to a, a problem is, let me give more money to the church or give more money to somebody yeah. who's going to do something about that. And we tend to kind of absolve ourselves of individual responsibility 
with that. Yeah. You had mentioned like one very just concrete need of like, okay, a lot of women need help like budgeting and handling a lot of these details that maybe their husbands were doing. What are some concrete things that Christians can do or should be looking to do in general for you know widows in their church or widows in their community? Okay, I'm gonna give you two simple things. And I'm telling you, if we could get these two simple things down, it's done. Okay, we're gonna put them on the screen under us. How about that, just to get people to drive it home. What's number one? Stay connected. The, uh, in my friendship network, 75% of my, our friends disappeared. And we were, my husband worked in a Christian organization. We were in a Christian church. In the churches, there's this thing like, oh my word, if we're around her, does that mean my husband's, I don't know. But we, we lose our connection. Stay connected. So in other words, someone personally needs to be contacting her. Someone personally needs to be, whether it's a phone call or a sit down or let me go on a walk with you or a text or however she communicates, stay connected. And then the second thing, almost as important, listen to her. Don't come in and think, we've got to set up a program in the church and collect some money to give money to widows that don't have money. No, they need to learn and have guidance for their finances. And my daughter and I are now have done a whole series on managing money. Uh, she's a lawyer and a CFP. And also we're, we have a book contract on that with Moody Press coming out. So to address that and listen to her, what does she need? She may not need a social life connection because it might be that she's going to the Y and swimming and that's her, her new friends. But she might need, do you have a, a, a Crown Financial Advisor that meets with people in your church or a program or something like that? But here's why I say, listen, don't say, well, we're going to have a program and have a, a Valentine brunch and we're going to invite all the elder couples and the widows and we're just going to sit down and have a great time. I wouldn't come to it. I don't want to sit with, no no offense, <laughs> elders are great, so are their wives, but it's like, it, no, not my idea of a Valentine. So that's why I say, listen, don't assume she needs X or Y or Z. What, what, is, what is she struggling with? Connect and listen. Those are two very simple things that, that we can do as a church. Now, now, Justin, I know that this topic, as we were talking about a little bit mm -hmm. before, kind of hits a little bit closer to home. Right. Well, so for you and you, yeah. had, you had some questions just because of some struggles that how that's played out for you. Right. Well, so I, I got to watch my mother when I, I my father died when I was 18. And so I'm the oldest of three. And, and when my father died very unexpectedly, you know, my mom had two kids. One was in high school, one was in middle school. Uh, at the time I was like I had just started college so I was out of the picture and I know that like we had people who meant very very well in our church who wanted to reach out they wanted to, to connect but she was grieving she was having a really tough time and she was not great I don't think all the time about kind of communicating with people who are reaching out are, are there you in your background as a counselor I think would probably help you a lot with this what what counsel do you give to somebody look I want to help this person out but I'm just having a hard time breaking breaking through I believe there's a need but we're having some of those just issues of grief and communication how do I love somebody that doesn't necessarily immediately tell me that they want to be loved in that way I'm so glad you asked that and I'm the right person because here I have all these degrees in counseling and I have had a career in that. So just as every person is different, so is the way they will respond be different in the grieving process. Some in the grieving process want to be around a few others that just listen and hand them tissues and they don't want to talk to you. They don't want you to you know, be blabbering away or whatever but they want your nearness. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing, sometimes it depends on our personality. If we're fearful or if we typically are wondering, is that person really and has my best interest at heart? I had people reach out to me that thought I was gonna be their next wife. Whoa, okay. <laughs> 
Okay, so excuse me, my humor has gone a little south, but that, that's, that's... No, no, you're fine. You know, and that, that's not the first time I've heard stories like that. I remember there was a, a pastor at a church that I was at years ago who, when his wife was dying of cancer, women in the church reached out and said, hey, just want to let you know when, when your wife goes, I'm here for you. And it was like, oh... Oh, that's people, so awkward. People, come on, come oh. on. Yeah, I imagine it, it I, can, I can see how it could even be worse uh, with men on the prowl just knowing our culture. Oh uh, my gosh. Culture broadly, but. <laughs> <laughs> We're uncovering here. People, even Christians can do stupid. We can major in stupid. I do stupid all day long, Miriam. I've got you covered. We go back to the word of God. What does the word of God say? Well, in Acts, some of the widows were hungry and needed food. Mm. And sometimes they had families that could feed them. So it's personal. But it's also that widow. Like there might be someone that says, I don't want to go to the group lunch today. Or I am so overwhelmed with my, in your case, two kids still at home. I don't even know what to say. And sometimes grief comes on a person and dumps all at once. And sometimes they don't cry for two years. And there it is. The grieving process is not a computer cut and dried. Here's the steps. And I know old models of grieving had steps one through six. I know those. They're inaccurate mm. because God made us uniquely. Psalm 139, Psalm 139, 13 to 16, we're all uniquely made. So some people, and in our widows groups, when we have them, and we have uh, lessons that people can use for those, we sit at a, we have a lesson, then we sit at a table with maybe six people. A lot of times the new widow that comes, and it might be her daughter that brings her or a neighbor, the first time she comes, she doesn't say a word. She just listens. That's okay, let her. Another one might say, I need a boyfriend, I'm lonely. And we say, oh, wait a minute don't that's that's not what you do with lonely so in other words i think what you're uncovering in this conversation it's so important we're all different and the other thing is many times you'll invite us to things and for a while we'll say no but don't stop inviting us mm. i didn't want to go out with couples to eat for several months but now i do i can go out with other couples i'm fine i do it all the time now don't stop inviting us I think maybe maybe that's a, a good note to to wrap up on. But I, I what I what I want to see there right now is we learned connect, mm -hmm. we heard uh, listen, and I think a third one is continue. So it's CLC, right? It's continue, and I think that's the that's probably where where most of us will will struggle. We can connect, we can listen, but the moment we feel like, oh, well, they don't really want this. That's the, that's the problem. And I think life gets in the way, yeah. you know, you get distracted and you, you, you've failed yes. to continue to follow through. Yes. And what, you know, what I'm hearing Miriam say is that you just gotta, you gotta be patient. Thank you for that exhortation, Miriam. That's perfect. And I would say too, Jesse, I'm sorry for your loss. And that's important for us to to recognize, you know, that it touch our average age is between 55 and 58. Some people think we're all in Florida or Arizona and we're a lot older. So, I mean, we forget about those young women whose husbands were on a treadmill or a policeman or in the military or mm -hmm. in construction. And I connect with many of those and have them in our DVDs because that young widow she needs that connection. Don't think because she's raising kids, she doesn't have time and might not want someone to listen to what's hard for her at the time. So uh, you've really tapped on so many very important topics. You guys got to keep going. We intend to, we hope to, uh, by the grace of God. Um, Miriam, again, thank you for joining us today. If you want more information about Miriam's ministry, which uh, you'll, you'll see is an easy thing to, to start at your church. It's an easy thing for, for you to say, hey, we're going to start doing that CLC. We're going to connect. We're going to learn. We're going to continue. All you got to do is go to the website. Marion, would you say it again for us? Widowconnection.com. All one word. Widowconnection.com. You'll see pictures from global stuff that we do and the, the money programs that we have now that we've created. A lot of resources there. May they bless you. That's awesome. Thank you so much for being here, for hanging out with us. 
Yeah. Uh, man, this is an important topic, and and yeah, I mean, hey, for you, those of you watching, we hope that you've enjoyed the conversation. I hope it's stimulating. Uh, yeah. it's and been for a, those of you listening yeah. on the new podcast, new we podcast, hope that we we want to let you know we put the uh, information for Widow Connection uh, and more for more information about Miriam in the description. We're so glad that you joined us, and we hope that you'll join us next week as we continue to explore faith and uh, as we continue to explore life and breath, humanity at the margins. So leave us a like, press subscribe on podcast or YouTube, uh, and give us a good review as well. Why not? Give yeah. a review on Apple yeah, Podcasts. Sure. I know. And if, uh, and if you have a really hot take about something unrelated to this and you want to espouse your violent political opinion, by all means, do so in the comments. That's what it's there for. Yeah. Oh, have a great day. We'll see you soon. <laughs>